Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I am so blessed to be here, and I thank you for that song, Patrick. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank Amanda for uh, allowing the Lord to use her and invite me here today. And uh, good to meet you and your husband. And, uh, really blessed to see this church, but I think y'all built this church too small. <laughs> I think you, I think you uh, built this church too small. We're in the end time. Now, a lot of you don't know me, but I've been the, the director, chaplain for Florida Prison Ministry for 20 years, and retired about six years ago, and and uh, the Lord called me back. Amen. So here I am, after 26 years to all prison ministry in Florida Conference and Kentucky 10 and Southeastern and, and South Central and South, South Central. The, uh, I am also the chairman of a uh, Three Angels Tube, which is uh, like YouTube, which is all having the sermons on air. They even have things on air about gardening and other things. All having a thing where we've gone around the world with with that uh, website, so if you want to go on there and look at some of the sermons and stuff like that, they're on there. And your pastor can put sermons on there if he wants to. So I thank the Lord for bringing me here today. Your grace is Heavenly Father. I thank you so much for bringing me to this church today. Amen. And I pray for you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Amen. I don't know why you brought me here, but I know that you brought me here for a reason. For somebody special, maybe, whatever it might be. But I thank you for this opportunity to witness for you today. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, I will say this. My afternoon program is basically going to be a continuation of this. Four and a half hours. And 80% uh, of what we're going to do today and the afternoon is for anybody who wants to work in the end time. It's not all about prison ministry. It's only a small part about prison ministry. But the Lord brought me here for a reason, and I'm going to do the best I can with what I, He allowed me to do to do that. I spent the majority of my life as a Catholic, <coughs> and uh, in my early 40s, I found my life in, uh, involved in sin and my marriage in, in trouble, and my uh, uh, ex-wife decided that... Uh, we need to put some life in our marriage and go out drinking and partying and this and that and the other. Then I found myself laying in a drainage ditch about four to six feet deep where the silt of the road washes in with my nose and eye buried in that silt at the bottom of that drainage ditch on a dark rainy night. And, uh, and I knew I was going to die in that drainage ditch because it was raining and nobody knew, seen me fall in there that I knew of. And I cried out to the Lord, I did everything I knew to the Lord as a Catholic, and nothing works. If you're real, I need you now. When you're drunk, and you can't cut yourself up, you're too drunk to be able to do anything. You don't have reception or time or anything, but somehow the Lord allowed somebody to come pick me up at that drainage ditch. <clears throat> and changed my life. The next week at work, a co-worker offered to buy me a drink. And as we were talking and stuff, I knew the Lord was talking to me through that person. And I decided to take a couple week vacation and try to get my mind back on track and everything. But it was just as bad after that. My ex-wife wanted to have a boyfriend, a lover, and she Got up one night after dinner, got dressed, and went out and went with this guy and, and left. We had four kids. I put the four kids to bed, and I got the gun out. I would go blow her brains out and his brains out. She had left before and came back and left before, so anyhow. So anyhow, the gun accidentally went off, and the Lord said to me, no, no, don't do that. 
There's no other way to do it. So I put the gun away and I've got out of that marriage because either she's going to kill me or I'm going to kill her. So after I got out of the marriage, I started dating my present wife. And she was in the Assembly of God Church, and I went to the Assembly of God Church for her, and I loved it. I started reading my Bible, and I started getting closer to the Lord, and this and that and the other. I couldn't get enough of it. And I love the Assembly of God people because they're enthusiastic about this Bible and about worship and stuff. Adventists don't appreciate it like some of God people do. Amen. But they don't have the truth. I knew there was always something missing. <clears throat> and I, but I enjoyed working with them. I got rebaptized in the, in the Assembly of God Church. And uh, Maxine and I went out one day in one of these tourist stores, stores in uh, Florida to sell oranges and stuff to tourists and little trinkets and stuff. And I was in there. There was a book rack in the corner over there, and the book kind of caught my eye, and I, I, uh, I looked at it, and it said, All in the name of the Lord, and I bought that book. It just it triggered me. And I started reading it, and I got so mad, I started to throw it away. <laughs> I happened I'd be 40 some years of age and not known something that were just spouting off in this book. And, uh, and uh, Brother Strickfellow doesn't tell you who the people are in the first book. You've got to send it for a second book. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And, uh, and I looked in there and it said it was published in, uh, by Concerned Publication in Claremont, Florida. And Maxie and I lived 15 minutes from Claremont, Florida. And I said, no way, there's no public publishing house in Claremont, Florida. But I looked at the phone book and there was Brother Strickfellow's name. I called that rascal up. <laughs> I was mad. I was mad. I could have died in that greatest ditch and not known this message. I called him up. Asked him who these people were. Who, and he told me something the other. So I said to him, I said, you know, my wife and I would go out and buy, spend fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars worth of religious book, religious book, and I've never run across any of this stuff in any of the bookstores I've been in. He said, well, we don't allow our books to be sold in the secular stores because we don't want them sold on the Sabbath. I said, what, you're crazy? I said, God's books sold all over the world on the Sabbath. Is your stuff better than God's book? I was mad. I could have died in that drainage ditch. People are going to die because they have not heard this message. And that frightens me. Frightens me. Scares me. And then he told me where we'll hit our bookstore. <laughs> I said, how was I ever going to wander in and then let alone find it? Frightened. I could have missed this message. So where do you find the Seventh-day Adventist Church? You go to the Yellow Pages. The smallest font you can find, we put out name and address in there. And, so, and sometimes we didn't even have an address in there. So I looked in the phone book, there was three Adventist church in there, and no address for any one of them. I called all three, sometimes I'll have a message. Nobody ever called back, nobody ever answered the phone. I talked to my Assembly of God pastor about what I found out. He says there's all kinds of kooks out there. When he told me there's all kinds of kooks out there, I knew I was in the wrong church. Amen. Now, if he had to talked to me a little bit about it, then I would have bought the message and said, hey, this is okay. But he wouldn't even talk to me about it. Now, I couldn't find a Seventh-day Adventist church, so I told Maxine, I said, obviously God's not in this thing because I can't find a church. <laughs> so time went by. I'd given up. I completely forgot about it. The only time I was homesick, the thought would be somebody came knocking at my door. We lived on 10 acres out in the woods. This young man says, I was impressed by the Lord to come visit you today. I said, I'm the pastor. And we took lessons and we became some day we joined a church. I've been a deacon, uh, head, an elder, 
School Board Sam, and the yes. chairman. But in 1988, I was tired of playing church. Because that's what Adventists do best. We play church. So I resigned from everything except being an elder and decided that I was going to go out and try to find the lost. None of you out here are looking for a drain, a drunk lane in the drainage ditch. You're not looking for anybody out here to witness to. People are going to die because we fail to do what the Lord called us to do. So this friend of mine said, I've been doing prison ministry. I said, no, that's not my thing. I don't care anything about it. So I gave up on it. And a few months later, he said, well, look, we're going to go to the prison over here and give out Bible lessons and stuff. Why, why don't you and Maxine take off day work and we'll go over there. So we went down there and we did this program and stuff. And the inmate said, please write, please come back. You people are different. Different? Different? So I told Maxine, I said, look, we need to take off and go up to Verbena, Alabama and find out what prison ministry is about. <laughs> so we took off a weekend and we went up there. And on Friday, and then actually made a, a, a he got out of prison. He was it came up there on Monday. <clears throat> we all went on prison on Friday night. It was the same thing. Please write, please come back. You people are different. Different? What did he see was different? So I told Maxine that we're driving home back to Orlando. I said, I'm going to pray and fast for the Lord to tell me what he wants me to do with the rest of my life. Yeah. I was a big manager in aerospace working at Lockheed Martin out here. I had four managers working for me. <coughs> Millions of dollars worth of budgets. A nice job. 30 years uh, experience out there. And uh, in three days, the Lord told me to quit my job, to go to work for him. My boss was telling me for a year they're going to promote him to an upper another position, and when, he, when they do, I'm going to take his job. I went in Wednesday, and I was talking to him, and he said, you know, they, they're going to promote him now, but I'm not going to take his place. I said, that's okay, Al, I'm quitting. You can't do that. You got all these contracts. You got to be dealing with the government. You're doing this, you're doing that. I said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving at the end of the month. <clears throat> so I got up that Sabbath <clears throat> and I had this letter. Get my age to kind of be a little bit smaller here. Says, Pray the, praise the Lord for truly His worthy. I thank God for placing in your hearts and come to visit with us. I mean the inmates because they are part of me and I know what it means to have someone visit you. God has created a beautiful ministry, a prison ministry. God is reading guide behind prison walls through His holy word because you guys weren't afraid to let God's spirit lead you and others like you. I have peace of mind, joy, happiness in the Lord. And most of all, eternal life in Christ Jesus. Remember that you want you reach or two is worthy of all the time you put in these prisons. This is the second time I heard this statement. I felt led of the Lord to write you this letter. To let you know that Jesus is working the lives of us all. So thanks for, for sharing the word yourself and time with us because God's people like you and the ministry through God are free indeed remembering me in your prayer, son, son brother, brother Johnny. I knew when I heard those words, I was impressed by the Lord to write you this letter that the Lord was telling me I had made the right decision of quitting my job. Amen. Now I quit my job, big pay a job for $1,400 a month for the rest of my life in retirement. I figured that's good enough for my brother because I'm going to the Lord's coming back in five to ten years. It's now 26 years, and they haven't come yet. Now, let me tell you something. When I married Maxine, she said to me, Honey, would you pay tithes and offerings on her check, and I do what I want in mine. When I married her, I couldn't afford another month's rent where I was living. 
I was paying alimony for I mean, the child support for four kids. And I, so anyhow, so I said, honey, when you and I got married, we promised to follow father and going all the way. We wrote the check for both tithes and offering on that. Both checks. We've never been late making a payment. We've never missed making a payment. The Lord allowed us to buy 10 acres, put a home on it, and be out of debt in 12 years so I could go to work for the Lord. Amazing how the Lord works. Now, you know in Malachi, God says, test me. When your tithes are not, test me. The important thing about paying tithes and offering, my brothers and sisters, is the second greatest gift that the Lord has given us and we don't even understand. You cannot lose work for God. 26 years, my bank account has stayed the same. What does Philippians 1, 19 say? Huh? See, you don't even, you don't even know your Bible. You've got to have, you've got to know your Bible. It says, uh, do what? 4, 19. Philippians 4, 19. Now I shall supply all your needs. Do what? My God shall supply all your needs. He'll supply what? All. No, not all. Oh. It can't be true. God lied in the book. There's got to be something else in there that says, hey, you've got to do this or another for him to do that. He'll supply all my needs. We don't understand the Bible. We don't believe the Bible. Now here I was with my job. Now I only quit my job to go into prison to a little Bible study. Do you hear me? And after I quit my job, God said, no, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to go to train people to do Bible study. Lord, how can I do that? I mean, you're talking about Jonah. I mean, tell you. That frightened me to my to my toes because I was an introvert. I couldn't get up front and talk. I was a big manager. I'd walk all work all day, all night, get my job done on time and on schedule, so I would not have to get up amongst my peers and give her an excuse. When I became an Adventist, they said, uh, "How about doing prayer for Sabbath school?" I said, "Well, that's not too bad. Maybe I can do that." When we're up here kneeling, my leg muscle froze, my back muscle froze. When we got up uh, to do the prayer, my shirt was soaking ring and wet as I mumbled the prayer. Amen. God gave me the text. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. You know what it says? Trust the Lord with all my heart. It says, trust in the Lord. Frank trust in the Lord with all Frank's heart. Trust in the Lord with all Frank's heart. My name ain't your. Is your name your? No, your name is not you. <laughs> you got to make the Bible personal because God is talking to you and me through His Word. Trust in the Lord with all Frank's heart. How much of it? All. No. What you got left over from everything else you did? Does all mean all? Then it goes on and says, lean not on Frank's own understanding. God says, Frank, your understanding is you're an introvert, and that's paralyzed you from doing the work that I'd have you to do. Now, if you allow me, I'll make you into what I'd have you to be if you allow me to do that. Amen. Lean not on your own understanding. See, all you got is an understanding of each one of you here why you're paralyzed and you can't do the work God's called you to do. You don't believe the Bible. Amen. Then it says, in all Frank's ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct Frank's path. You say, hallelujah. Amen. I can't lose working for God. Amen. I can't lose working for God. Now, here he wants me to do this training, and I'm paralyzed because I'm an introvert and can't do it. So I'm like Jonah. I said, Lord, if you give me a training program, I'll go do it. 
who's going to give him, how's the Lord going to give me a training program? You know, it's nonsense. Well, you know what? The training program I've got is what God gave me, and I've been using it for 30 some years, and I have trained people from one end of this country to the other end of this country, and people I've trained through this training program 30, 20 years ago are still doing it today. Because there's something about the training program, people have told me it is so powerful they have to go home and took them a year to get their life in order so they could go to work for the Lord. Now, I, because I'm an introvert, I say, Lord, if you give me a training program, I'll go do it, but I'm not going to fight myself anyplace. <laughs> Who knows me? I'm a little <coughs> Adventist in a little place called Lady Lake, Florida, and uh, nobody knows me. The Congress don't know me. Nobody knows me. So I said, Lord, if the phone rings, I know the Holy Spirit's calling me and I'll go do it. I got it made. Nobody knows me. <coughs> you see, God tricked me. <laughs> you know what? He tricked me. If he'd have told me what he wanted me to do before I quit my job, you think I'd quit my job? No. <coughs> but once I quit my job, I couldn't go back. But they're not going to give it to me after I walked out of them. Now, you see, I tried to trick God. If the phone rings, uh, who knows me? Nobody knows me. I have a handful of friends know my phone number. If the phone rings, I know the Holy Spirit's calling me and I'll go. You see that young lady there? You ask her, that phone has been ringing off the hook for 26 years. Two to three times a month for 26 years. Two to three months. Here I quit my job. Here I am 81. The Lord is still calling me back. And gives me the strength to do this. Amen. You don't believe the Bible. You don't believe God. Who am I? I'm no different from anybody in here. Except somebody who was willing. To give his life to be used by God. To do what he called him to do. My brothers and sisters. I wanted to do a... Uh, I wanted to do a video the first year that I started prison ministry. I wanted to go into prison and do a video that I could bring to you and show you what prison ministry is like. I made a deal with the chaplain at Jefferson Hill Correction. We're going to go over there on Friday at 8 o'clock and we're going to take testimony for video from the inmates. So I can take them around to the church and do it. Plans are all made. I have people come from Alabama, people the next day they come from Miami. The photographer and video guy coming from the uh, conference of it. We're all going to converge on that prison on Friday at 10 o'clock. I want my work just out two weeks ahead of time. Yeah, I'm a big businessman. I mean, I, I know how to plan and work these things out. The day before, the chaplain called me and said, the plans have changed. He said, no, I'm not staying in the afternoon anymore. You need to be here by 8 o'clock in the morning. I said, chaplain, I said, I got people traveling on the road to come here to, to meet us all there. He said, it's tough. tough. And here I'm an introvert. 